good year and in his time. Good morning, everyone. We've been having all kinds of fun up here today. No pianists, too many pianists, whatever. It's all good. God's in control, so it all works out. So, it's the last Friday of camp meeting already. Hard to believe how quickly it's gone by. But let's do some singing this morning. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after you, which is why we come to camp meeting. I listened to some stories the other day about some people who are talking about when they came to know Jesus. And sometimes we wonder why it takes a while for some people and not for others. But this next song says it all. It's in his time. In his time when he works in us. In his time when he comes to get us. We're getting excited. But we have to trust that it's God's time. In his time, he will make all of us beautiful.
aqui. Thank you, Laurie. And uh, Miss Mickey Wilde, thank you for filling on the piano, too. Much appreciated. Good morning, everybody. Have you been enjoying uh, the camp meeting so far this week? Yes? We want to say uh, welcome to our viewers out there. Uh, well, we're uh, streaming to all of the world here from uh, Wakanda, Camp Wakanda, a place set apart. It has been a really good, good week. And as we wind down for the Sabbath, there are um, some few items here that I want to mention for you. Um, if you're interested in getting uh, some meal tickets for yourself or for someone else that's coming in town here, you may want to do that uh, today, and they can be purchased at the administration building. So uh, you can go over there and uh, get your meal tickets. If uh, you want to view any of these um, videos or the sermons that have been going on, these discussions, you can go to our conference website and uh, or onto the Facebook page as well, too, and uh, you'll see that there will uh, be a, a category there that you can uh, click on and watch. Actually, it's just on the website itself, the conference website. All righty, and um, want to also announce that uh, Andrews University will be doing that strawberry shortcake. That's always been a, a favorite here every Sabbath. And that'll be at 2 p.m. And uh, for the for all of you too, the Nature Center is going to be open uh, on Sabbath from 1 to 3. And then the little red schoolhouse at um, uh, let's see here at the little red schoolhouse at 3:30 on Sabbath afternoon, there will be treats, balloons, and stuffed animals for all the boys and little boys and girls. So if you want to bring them on by, it gives you a little afternoon activity. And we don't want to also forget about that we'll have uh, two other events happening tomorrow afternoon. There'll be the ordination and uh, uh, tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. And then also at about 4 o'clock, there'll be a, uh, the baptism down uh, at the lake. But we want to kind of keep on top of that. There are some uh, thun thunderstorms. In fact, there's a little lightning bolt about 4 o'clock and uh, on, the, on the weather channel there. So we are monitoring that, and so there may be some adjustments made to that. So you have been all week long listening to uh, Pastor Carl Munoz. Uh, he's the director from Amazing Facts Evangelism, and he'll be up here shortly. I just want to make another announcement that uh, they ha have been, or I should say uh, Pastor Carlos and Pastor Daniel, have been with me over at uh, Fireside uh, Lodge, and they've been presenting at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. They have one more meeting this afternoon where they'll be presenting at 4 o'clock. And they've got an exciting um, preview uh, to show uh, for you. Actually, it's full length at about 50 minutes. And you will see the latest uh, release from Amazing Facts with Doug Batchelor, Kingdoms in Time. And so you might want to come by, be there early. They're going to give a short introduction, and we're going to get right into it. That's going to be at 4 o'clock. And with that, um, that concludes the, the messages, other than what's going to be a beautiful day today. And I hope it's God-filled for all of you. Lori, why don't you come on up here and do our song for us. Thank you. Please stand with me as we sing our theme song, More About Jesus, I Would Know. your heads. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this time we've had to be here in this place you've set apart for us to come and be refreshed and refilled. And we ask that your Holy Spirit will again be with us today. Bless the speakers, keep us all safe, Father, and may you come quickly so we can have many camp meetings in heaven with you, we pray in your name, amen.
Maranatha. All right, some of you are more excited. We uh, welcome my loved ones. Uh, we want to thank again for our 
It's our last day presenting, uh, at least in this morning. So we, me and my wife want to thank uh, the Wisconsin Conference and everybody that's been coming during these days. It's been a, it's been a pleasure to be here. We want to thank for the wonderful music that we've been uh, uh, also enjoying and uh, company, new friends, just a very nice time. This is our first camp meeting. Uh, my brother, I think I can speak for my brother Daniel too, and we've uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. So uh, thank you very much. You've all been nice, and it's good to know more of, a, of our family that we're going to be seeing in the new earth and the new heavens. Amen? Amen. And so uh, let's get right to it. As always, there's a lot to speak about and so little time. So please join me to Revelation at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Go with me, please. We've been studying off of Revelation chapter 12. Uh, Revelation chapter 12. Amen? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you again uh, for this wonderful opportunity to come together and, and study your word, to spend time in, in, in praising your name through song, through prayer. And uh, we ask, Father, that now as we come to study this uh, final presentation of this time slot, that you may bless us and guide us and show us the things, that, the things that we need to do, Father, in order to prepare for the things that are coming. We know that you have given us this wonderful message, the three angels' message, and, and, and seeing the things that are happening. We, it's not just about knowing it. It's about preparing for them, and being ready to do your work. And so we ask that you guide us and strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen. Very good. So in Revelation chapter 12, right, we've been talking about there, uh, the, it breaks down the stages of the woman in seven stages of the church of God, and it, and it shows us right from the beginning all the way into the end. And we were studying yesterday in Revelation chapter uh, 13, 12 thir verses 13, we talked about uh, the ascension of Jesus Christ, and it talks about how in verse thir uh, 13, now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he did what? He persecuted the woman. He persecuted the church who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. So, so that first part of verse number 12 and 13 talking about that time frame of the year 31 to the year of 538 where the church was being persecuted and then also it moves into the 1,260 years where God protected his church uh, from the persecution that was occurring in Europe and in her colonies. But then it says in verse number 16, but the earth helped the woman and the earth opens its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. So God for 1,260 years protected his church, right? He sustained and maintained his church in, under the, the persecution of the, of the Antichrist and this beast system that arised. But then it said that after the 2,660 years, God did not have to help or protect his church anymore. Because why? Because the earth did it, right? And the reason we studied, right? We can study in, in history and chronology and look at the, the church. The, the church fled from European persecution and fled into a place, a land that was going to protect her. And we know that that prophetically fulfilling is pointing to the United States of America, right? And where this country, when it was founded, the constitutional foundations of this country were separation of church and state, right? The First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. So why did they do that? Well, because the founding fathers of this nation saw the abuses of church and state coming together in Europe, right? And the different stages. And they said, we don't want to follow what they're doing over there because we see how oppressive, how, how, how harmful, right? The, the atrocities that are committed. We said, we don't want to commit those mistakes. And so they founded this country on separating church and state. Amen. And so the church was able to, to flourish, to, to grow in this new land. But Revelation 17 says, and the dragon was enraged with the, and he went to make what? War, battle with the rest or the remnant of her seed who do what? Keep the commandments of God and have the? So notice my loved ones that in verse number 16 is saying, after the year 1798, the church found a place where she can grow, where she can flourish. Amen. But then it's saying that what's going to happen? That that same area that was protecting her is now going to do what? Go against her, right? And the war is going to be if she was protected because there was a separation of church and state. That means that if war now is going to be carried out, that means the tables are going to turn. That means that in this great nation of ours, what's going to happen? The constitutional separation of church and state is going to be what? 
is going to be deemed unconstitutional and powers of church and the powers of state are going to come together. That is what we know as the image of the beast, right? And so, all of these things, we love to talk about these things at Seventh-day Adventists. We just love prophecy. And it's fun, right? I mean, we, we love to talk about these things all the time. This is what we dedicate. But at the end of the day, the knowledge of these things is not what's most important. It is important. Don't get me wrong, right? But as important as it is, is knowing these things is getting and being prepared for these things. Amen? And so, we need to have a good balance on both. Amen? Some people, they, they focus on one aspect and they forget the other. Some people focus on the, no, we need to have a balance, a good balance on all, both of these aspects are very important. And so we've been talking about how can we prepare, and there are just so many places in the Bible. I mean, I wish we had like a month, and we can just go through and have a deep study on, on all of the signs and all of the, of the messages that God is preparing in his word to prepare us. And one of those places we went yesterday was in Matthew chapter 24, Amen. Matthew chapter 24, we were reading, and Jesus says, As it was in the times of Noah, so shall it be right before my return, right? And we know that the battle of Armageddon, which is in Revelation chapter 12, 17, this last war, this last battle is happening right before the return of Jesus Christ, right? This battle, now remember, my loved ones, this battle or this conflict is, is, is not just external in the sense of that there are forces on the outside trying to, to come in, but it's also an internal battle, Right? External, the commandments of God. Internal, the war against the spirit of prophecy and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Are you catching me? There is a battle inside of the church, at the soul of our church, at the very heart of our message. And it's what? It's, it's putting aside, it's set, setting aside the spirit of prophecy, my loved ones. And if you, my brother or sister, are here today, and you have questions and doubts about that's fine. That's no problem with that. But if you are standing up in a position to it, if you are rebelling against the messages that God has given us, my loved ones, then you are doing the work of the devil. Because it says that the dragon makes war on the church for those two reasons. Are you following me? And so we need to be careful that there's a difference between having a healthy, uh, a healthy question, right, and not knowing and not understanding and wanting to know more than, than to be attacking and to be putting down. Because if you put aside the spirit of prophecy, then everything else is going to fall by the side too, right? And so the beauty of it, my loved ones, is that this is what it's talking. These are the messages that God says. And so God, we saw... Yesterday in Matthew chapter 24, beginning around verse 36, God, Christ says that as they were doing during the times of Noah, they were doing what? They were eating and drinking, and right? And of course, eating and drinking applies to, to, to gluttony, right? And to, and to uh, um, uh, alcohol and all of these things, yes. And marrying and giving into marriage, these are all things that we can look at the world. But remember, the message is an internal message too, Amen. Right? It's not just mentioning to the world, the message is to the church. And we saw that this concept of eating and drinking specifically, we saw that in a deeper context, we went to a number of verses where Jesus was talking about, we went to Luke chapter 5 and we went to Matthew chapter 9, and the eating and drinking was what? Who remembers? Eating and drinking was? Was not fasting, right? Eating and drinking was not fasting because they told the disciples of Jesus, wait a minute, your disciples, what? They eat and drink. And then in the, other, in the other phrase, a parallel verse to that where we went to Matthew chapter 9, it says that your, 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 uh, your disciples do what? They, they don't fast, right? And Jesus says, this is not the time for fasting because the what? The husband is here, amen? But when I leave, then it's going to be a time, amen? And so what we're seeing then, my loved ones, is that the message is that the concept of fasting in this Bible. And then we saw that during the times of Jesus, I mentioned to you, I actually went and looked and, and studied it. It was that there were 29 types of different fasting during the times of Jesus Christ, and they would fast two times a day. Now, these were traditional fasts implemented uh, by the leadership, but there was only one day that was a day of fasting. Only one biblical day that was accounted as a day of fasting. What day was that, my loved ones? The Day of Atonement, right? And we saw that on the Day of Atonement, the Day of Reconciliation, the day in which the, the sins of, of, of God's people were going to be taken out, eliminated, done away with. On that day, what had to, what was, that was the high priest had his purpose, and God in the sanctuary had his purpose. But what, was the, what were the people supposed to be doing on the Day of Atonement? Afflicting their soul, right? Afflicting their soul. And so let's look at the definition here of afflicting the soul. Affliction, the word ana. Right? We'll see it here up on the screen. Means to humble, 
to weaken, to submit self, right? And so we saw a number of different uh, of examples in the, con- in the concept of afflicting the soul. And it means sanctifying, humbling yourself, putting yourself and recognizing, right? It's, exam- it's self-examination. It's analyzing our spiritual life. And we saw an example of that also from... Um, Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah said he afflicted his soul, and thanks to him doing that, he was able to what? To have a a clear mind, right? So that when the angels came, he understood the urgency and the message, and he listened to it, contrary to what happened during the times of Noah. And we saw Daniel 2 in Daniel chapter 9. It says that he, what he afflicted his soul, right, in prayer and supplication and fasting, And remember, my loved ones, when we're talking about afflicting the soul and the concept of fasting, fasting does have physical uh, benefits, right? There are physical benefits, but we're really looking at is the spiritual one. So let's look at that quote again that really impacted my life when I understood this from this the 2012 devotional. It was in Spanish. I translated into English, and it says like this: the main benefit from fasting is what Mental. mental clarity that is obtained through what. Partial or total abstinence of food. And what is the purpose? To prepare the person to perceive the will of God in a much more clearer way. Amen? Who wants to perceive the will of God in a much more clear way in your lives? Amen? So that means that what? Fasting is part of it, right? Fasting is what? It's part of this afflicting of the soul. Coming together with these elements is that to understand and know, am I right with God? Am I right with the Lord? Am I truly living the Lord's will? Am I truly following in his way? Or am I thinking I'm being a great Christian? I'm thinking I'm doing just fine. I'm just sitting there. I have my seatbelt on. And I'm on cruise control to heaven. And this is what we should be doing. Analyzing. Afflicting of the soul. And I told you of the example of Jonah chapter 3. Right? Did anybody go back and read Jonah chapter 3? Amazing chapter. Right? Right? Where Jonah went to preach to the pagans. Nineveh, the worst of all cities, my loved ones. And Jonah went and preached to them of Nineveh. And what happened? They repented. And if you read the chapter, my loved ones, of Jonah chapter 3. It said, ooh, the Lord is going to do, bring judgment. He's going to destroy Nineveh in 40 days. And what is the first thing that they did? They fasted, it said. The first thing that these pagans did was fast. Why did they fast? Because they wanted what? Mental clarity to perceive the will of God in a much more clear way. They saw Jonah. They knew Jonah. That's the guy that was swallowed up by a fish. That's the guy that died. And they saw a resurrected man walking into their city saying, judgment is coming, right? The sign of Jonah as Jesus had mentioned about, amen? And so they said, if he resurrected his prophet and he brought him here to tell us this, that means things are getting really serious here, right? Despite all of the issues that we're having externally in the wars, but that was the sign that really caught their attention. In the same way, the life of Jesus Christ when he resurrected, right? Do you think that really caught the attention of those that were witnessing to this? Oh, yes, my loved ones. And so they did what? They fasted. The king fasted. And they say, let us fast. Let us see what is happening. And then they went to see what is it that we're doing that is going to have God bring judgment on us. Did it work? Yes, in the initial stage, it did work, right? Yes, they did. It said God, they repented from their sins, amen? So in order to to repent from our sins, we need to know what? We need to know what our sins are. And sometimes we're not aware of the things that we're doing. And so fasting is helping us. It's not the end. It's the means to be able to understand and analyze and, and evaluate our spiritual lives and see if we are doing the correct thing. Can I hear an amen for that? Now... Here's where it gets interesting. Because that was the afflicting of the soul in the old covenant in the earthly sanctuary. That was part of the ceremonial feast days, right? The day of atonement. And we know that those seven ceremonial feast days in Leviticus chapter 23 are prophecies. Amen? They are prophecies. And so we know that as we look through the seven ceremonial feast days, each one pointing to a prophecy that was going to be fulfilled, not in an earthly sanctuary with an earthly priest, but in a heavenly sanctuary with a heavenly priest and so we know that the prophetic fulfillment of the day of atonement was when jesus christ went from the holy place into the most holy place in what year my loved ones in 1844 so i have a question for you then what should we be doing then because our high priest has entered into the most holy place 
So what should we be doing? We need to be doing what? Afflicting our soul. Amen? Now it's not a day of atonement. Now it's the process of atonement. Right? And so in the same way as the high priest went in, that was the signal. Right? That was the signal to us to know, okay, the end is coming. Right? And remember, on the Day of Atonement, if, those, if the high priest didn't do exactly what, what, what he was told, if God's people didn't do exactly what they were told, and if those sins were not carried out and taken out of the sanctuary on that day through the scapegoat, if, those, if the sanctuary was not cleansed, remember, God would not dwell with his people the next calendar year. And if God didn't dwell with his people the next calendar year, what would happen to the millions of, of Hebrews that were in the desert? They would all die immediately. Are you catching the, the tune? And so in the same context, my loved ones, what should we be doing now? What is the message that we have? It's the most holy place message. It's the most holy place experience. Talking back about the Protestant Reformation, amen? Our brothers and sisters from other denominations, they have helped lead the way to restore the plan of salvation. And it is our job to finish that message, amen? To take the things that the Protestant reformers started from the different pieces of furniture and see how that has been restored. And now it's our job to finish, to close with this message of the most holy place, my loved ones. Nobody else preaches this message. We have been blessed with the most holy place message, with the most holy place experience. Amen? But the question is then, what does that imply for us? What does the most holy place imply for us? Go with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Now, there are so many ways we can study this again. There's so much just juicy and good information. I'm just, I'm just you know, skimming off the top. I want to I wanna create a foundation for you to continue to go in and study deeper. And I'm going to give you a couple of pointers on exactly how we can have a greater understanding of this message. Hebrews chapter 9, who is there? Amen. Amen? And it says in verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 1. Then indeed even the first covenant had ordinance of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of holies, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid with, on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had what? The manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables, the tablets of the, com- of the covenant. And above it were the cherub of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak in detail. And so here it's telling us that in the most holy place you had, what piece of furniture was in the most holy place? The Ark of the Covenant. Very good. And so the Ark of the Covenant representing the throne of God, right? In this context, representing the beginning of judgment. But also, what was inside of the Ark of the Covenant? What was the aspect? The Ten Commandments, right? So, have we been called to raise up the principles of the Ten Commandments, right? Those ten promises that God has given us, amen? Those ten principles of holiness that, which, which God reigns over the universe, amen? But then there was also what? Aaron's rod, and there was manna. Now, if the, if the sanctuary is giving us the steps that we need to take to be able to return into the presence of God, if the sanctuary is detailing the steps in which God is going to separate us from sin, and Christ walked through every step of the sanctuary, and now we have to follow in those same steps, and then we have to go into the most holy place experience, so we have the Ten Commandments there, that we, 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 we have a, a very good understanding of that, but what about the manna and Aaron's rod. What does that represent? Now, I think Aaron's rod represents, I think it represents the spirit of prophecy, right? I'm not being dogmatic about this. I'm just thinking, right, that would be a whole nother study. But what about the manna? Why is the manna inside of the ark in the most holy place? And is God trying to tell us something about the most holy place experience? Is that we are going back into the presence, we're following the footsteps, and there in the most holy place are manna. Now, what is manna? Can we call manna food from heaven? Yes. Can we call it the divine menu? Right? Could it be that God is trying to tell us in the most holy place message, the most holy place experience, that as we are Walking away from the world and we are walking towards him. Could it be that he is telling us that we need to return back to the, uh, that divine menu? 
that original menu, that original food. And what was the original menu that God had given humanity? Go read it in Genesis chapter 1, right? Could it be that this message is God is saying, as you move away from the world and you start moving back into my presence, one of the things that is going to help you in this, in this path is what? Is to start to change your eating habits and your diet. Now, is that not what's happening here in the sense of God saying, afflict your soul, right? Could it be? Now, I'm just, I'm just brainstorming here. I'm just sharing with you the things that the Lord has impressed on my heart in regards to this message. Now, if you really think about it, what are we going to be eating in heaven, my loved ones? There's not going to be any Kentucky Fried Chicken. There's not going to be any, any uh, McDonald's, right? That menu was there because that menu was perfect. Amen? That menu was perfect for humanity. Now, there have been degradations and all these other things that have, that have, uh, have impeded a lot of this aspect and, and, and damaged, that's the word I was looking for, and damaged it. But could this principle still be in effect? Could God be telling us, I want you to start to, what? I want you to start to go back and start to move away and step away, and, and interestingly, step away from Babylon's buffet. Because the food of Babylon, and now we're going into the aspect of fasting. Remember, fasting is not necessarily not eating. It's, it, it's part, it could be part of it, but fasting in the context of the spiritualness of it is stepping away from those things that are not good for us, right? That are impeding, that are not letting us have a direct connection with the Lord. I have a question. Does food affect our health? Does food affect our mental health? Yes. Our physical health. Yes, it does. And so could it be that the food of Babylon is impeding that we have that connection with God? Now, are there stories in the Bible in regards of this? Oh, yes. Daniel chapter 1. Now, I love the book of Daniel because contrary to the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation mostly focuses on, on the signs and, and, and aspects of the things that are happening. But Daniel, while he does also touch on those elements, Daniel also goes into the aspect of the preparation for those times. Amen? And so Daniel, the book of Daniel is actually a blueprint, if you go through it, of the steps that God's people are going to be going through to the end times. And in Daniel 12, it finishes with that battle. Are you following me? And so what happens in Daniel chapter 1? These three, three, four Hebrew boys are taken out of Jerusalem. And where are they taken to? Babylon. And, uh, you know, there's a lot more, many details. It's a, a fascinating, fascinating chapter. But just an overview. And these four Hebrew boys are taken where? They're taken into Babylon. And what are they going to do with them? They were sent to the University of Babylon. Right? Because what was Babylon wanting to do with God's boys, God's children? Take away their culture, take away their eating habits, take away their God. He was, Babylon tries to strip us from our prophetic identity. You getting me? Babylon tries to strip you from who you are as a child of God. And they do that through different manners. Education, right? Changing the names, implying by changing the name and stripping that identity the name of God, right? And another important part of that Babylon tries to use to strip away our identity as children of God is in what? Food. And what did they say? Eat of the banquet. And what did these four boys do? What did they eat? They went back to the original diet. Now, I think, and it's very, it's very plausible that these four boys ate clean meats. Right? They celebrated the feast days, so they ate the Passover lamb, and, and I'm sure that it was part of, of their food. But yet, in Babylon, and I'm sure that in Babylon's buffet, there were clean meats. But there were also unclean meats, right? I'm sure there was some Pizza Hut thrown in there. I'm sure some Pepsi Cola, right? And yet, they chose to do what? Understanding and looking at the situation that they were in, understanding what they were in, it was probably an overwhelming situation having, they, none of them are over than 20 years old. Their parents were probably killed. They were stripped. They were stripped naked. It's believed that they walked from Jerusalem to Babylon. They were castrated. I mean, if anybody had an excuse to say, where is God? It's those four Hebrew boys. And they chose to remain loyal to God. 
And now that loyalty did not happen overnight. That loyalty, my loved ones, and I'm going to tell you this, there are going to be four sets of parents in heaven that we don't know their names, and it's the parents of those four Hebrew boys. Because that faith that they had through all the trials and tribulations that they went through, it was because of their upbringing. Amen? Their parents showed them the love of God through example, through testimony in the home. They saw it. I'm sure they had these struggles and difficulties as all young people do. But it comes a time that when the challenge comes, when persecution comes, that God's children stand up. And they stood up and they said, no, we're not going to do it. Did they benefit from it? Oh, yes. Look at the rest of the book of Daniel. Look at the faithfulness in Daniel chapter 3 and in all the other trials and tribulations. Again, it's pointing back to this aspect of how their diet, my loved ones, helped them. It says, Daniel, what? Knowledge and wisdom. And God spoke to him. And God used all of them. And the diet was directly related to it. They knew the spiritual warfare that was coming upon them. And they said, what? We need to have a clear mind. We need to have a focused mind. We need to be really connected with God. Because what is coming is too overwhelming for us. Imagine what we have already seen. And so they made the decision. I'm sure those four boys prayed together. And they said, they, they, and they said, what are we going to do, Lord? And the Lord said, afflict your soul. Amen? We also see it in the life of Jesus Christ. Do we or do we not? Matthew chapter 4. What, was, what is the first thing Jesus did to start off his ministry? He did what? He fasted. Notice again. Jesus knew what was coming. And he said, now... The spiritual warfare is about to begin. And the first thing he did was fast. For how long? 40 days. Look at what it says in the book, In Heavenly Places, chapter 188, The Test of Appetite. After his baptism, the Son of God entered the dreary wilderness, there to be tempted by the devil. For nearly six weeks, he endured the agonies of hunger, he realized the power of appetite upon man, and in behalf of sinful man, he bore the closest test possible upon that point. Continues. Here, a victory was gained which few can appreciate. The controlling power of deprived appetite and the grievous sin of indulging it can only be understood by the length of the fast which our Savior endured that he might break its power. Amen? Did he also have the same temptations? Oh, yes. Just as all of us. Nothing different. But it says, Intemperance lies, pay attention to the sentence, my loved ones. Intemperance lies at the foundation of all the moral evil known to man. Woo, that's a big statement. Christ began the work of redemption just where the ruin began. The fall of our first parents was caused by the indulgence of appetite in redemption. The denial of appetite is what? Is the first work of Christ. Amen? So we see that in this spiritual battle, diet is part of this preparation. Are you following me? In this preparation for this final battle. And so what I'm telling you is, my loved ones, if we have this message, and we know what's coming, what should we be doing then? Afflicting our soul. As Jesus did, as Daniel did, and Daniel and the other boys, and as we've seen so many times in Scripture. But what are we doing? That was the message of the prophet, right? Afflict your soul. But what are we doing? Eating and drinking. That's not important. That's not important. Let's just eat it up, right? It doesn't matter. That's not what my Bible tells me. That's not what my Bible tells me, my loved ones. My Bible tells me that this aspect of afflicting our soul, of fasting, right, is part of the preparation we need for the things that are coming. And so by denying this, if we choose to deny it, and if we choose to say, you know, that's not important. I want to continue to, in, to indulge. I want to continue to feed then what you're basically saying is by saying that you're, you're not willing to take that step, you're basically saying, you know what? I don't think it's that important. That's what we're saying. Are you following me, my loved ones? And so in the same way that Jesus was showing us this example, my loved ones, in the same way then, we should be taking this seriously. 
not taking care of our health, my loved ones. I'm going to be very blunt about this, and some people don't like this. But not taking care of your health is sin. Why? Because this is the instrument, and this is the instrument that God gave me to be for the Holy Spirit to use to finish this work. And so if I choose, remember, sin is selfishness, right? And so if I choose not to take care of my body and my mind, for whatever reason it be, the indulgences, whatever it may be, I'm robbing from God. It's actually part of stewardship, if you didn't know that, right? It's part of stewardship, but let just, I'll just give you a small example. Let's say that the plan of God was that I preach until I was 100 years old. Let's just put an example. And because I choose not to take care of my body, because I choose to eat things that I know that are not good for my body, because I choose to eat and do things that are not good for my body and my mind, I'm going to become sicker much more quicker, right? And so let's say I start uh, degenerating health and all wise when I'm around 60. And so by 60, I've been reduced to medication, to not being able to complete work. I just robbed God of 40 years. You understanding? This is how I'm looking at it. Now, you might think that, well, this, this guy's a, a bit over the, over the, over the overboard, but I, that's fine. I don't mind. I've been called worse. <laughs> that's how I see it. I'm robbing God. And this is not only having to do with me being the instrument for the Holy Spirit to help reach this message out to other people, but for my own salvation, right? And this is what God is talking to us. This is what he's pointing to us. Is everybody with me? But that's not the only definition in the concepts of fasting. We think fasting in the, in the concept of eating. But when you look at the definition of fasting, look at this. It's the Greek word nesti and the Hebrew word snum. And fasting means to cover or to put over. In other words, when you talk about fasting from eating, you're covering what? Your mouth. But there are other things we can cover that we shouldn't be. And we should also be fasting from, which is what? Ooh. Should we be fasting not only from the food of Babylon, but should we also be fasting from the entertainments of Babylon? And that's a whole other subject I'm not going to go into. I'm just laying some principles down for you, things that I want you to understand. For those that are really wanting to say, Lord, I want to do this work. I want to prepare. Amen? Are there things that we might be feeding our mind, our eyes and our ears that are also making us sick mentally, right? Sometimes we just tend to focus on the physical. Mental illness, my loved ones, is just as bad, if not even worse. And so are we feeding the things of Babylon into our mind? What are the things that we could be feeding that are affecting our mental health and that will affect our spiritual health? Well, what are the things that the world is selling us? Sexuality, violence, vengeance, spiritualism, those are the things that, well, through our, what we're watching, what we're listening to. And by doing that, again, in the same way that our body is being corrupted by the things that we're eating, our mind is being corrupted by the things that we're listening and watching. And so there are things that we should also be what? Stepping aside from. We shouldn't be paying attention. We shouldn't be watching these things. And I know this is very difficult. Don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting here standing on, on a high pedestal. I have my battles too. But as I've been asking the Lord, telling him to guide me, and I'm going to give you the key verse that I want you to focus on from this point on, I'm going to give you a key verse that I want you to read and remember every day in the morning when you stand up and pray and when you have your devotionals. And what is that key verse? Psalms 139, verse 23 and 24. Examine me, God, and know my mind. Test me and know my thoughts. And see if there be in me the way of iniquity and lead me where? Can you keep that verse up for a second? Examine me, God, and know my mind. Test me and know my thoughts. I have a question for you. Where does God examine me and test me? Where is that test and examination? The word of God. Commandments are part of it. But it's here. Here is where you say, God, when before I have my devotionals, I, I say, Lord, I'm about to get into your word. Please examine me. Test me. If there's something, Lord, that I'm doing that is not correct. If there's something that is impeding me that I grow 
in your word. If there is something that impeding me that I understand your word better. If there is something that is impeding me from having a closer walk and relationship with you, Lord, please show me. Show me, Lord. And that's what the Bible is. It has the flaws of his people too. Flaws that you and I can relate to. It's not this dare just, just, to, just to point at them and say, look at how devilish David was. It's to point to our own hearts and say, Lord, could this be me? Could I be David? Could I be Peter? This is what it's about. It's about seeing, Lord. Test me, Lord. Because if I am not, remember, there is nothing worse than on that great day saying, Lord, Lord, here I am. Look at all the great things I did in your name. Look at all the miracles I did. Look at all the, all the people I gave Bible studies to. Lord, look at, all, look at all, all the my neighbors that I gave tracts. And look at all the things that I did and all the camp meetings I came to, Lord. And I sent my kids to Adventist school. And I tried to do everything right, Lord. I tried. And he's going to say, depart from me. Whoa. Our, our motives and our, and our thoughts and our desires in line with the will of God. That's what it's all about. Because if not, everything else is worth nothing. And so every day, my loved ones, I share with you my biggest fear is that day. My biggest fear is that I think that I'm doing God's will. I could be preaching. I could be doing evangelism and traveling the world and doing all the things that we do. And I could be completely lost. Because even in this position... I can still be doing my own will and not the will of God. Are you following me? And so this is daily, a daily examination. The afflicting of the soul, our high priest is in the most holy place. And what? He's wanting to prepare me for salvation and to prepare others. Amen? Because it's not just about me. It's about me being an instrument to reach out to others. And, and listen to me. God wants to use each and every one of you here. And everybody that's listening and watching. God has a wonderful, amazing plan for your life. For your life and your family. God has a wonderful plan. He's just waiting on us. To let him execute that plan. And it says this Holy Spirit yearns. That's the cry. The pain of a mother. Or a father that lose their child. He's yearning. Because we say we love to, to live in the spirit. We say we love to walk in the spirit. And have a victorious Christian life. But we keep on feeding the flesh. And so. The Spirit will only do as much as we surrender. So if we have a partial surrender, he'll do partial work. To do a complete work, he, we, he needs what? A complete surrender. So again, it's testing my spiritual, physical health. As we've been learning with, with brother, uh, brother Arch, our finances, right? Marriage. Whoo! I did not know how selfish I was until I became a husband. And I haven't had kids yet, so I know that's another step up. My wife and me, we, we joke, and she says, whew, I'm, I'm, I'm in the 144,000. <laughs> I'm sealed dealing with you. It's a joke. But she does deserve it. She's a wonderful, wonderful wife the Lord has given me. Amen? Amen. And, but I see how selfish I am. And I, I struggle with this, my loved ones. I see it. Amen? And it's not what, is, what, do, do, what do I think my wife thinks about me. Is what does my wife think about me? Amen? And it's having that connection with God and with her also in that context. Amen? Discipleship. We've been talking about it in the training in the afternoon. Am I fulfilling my purpose as a disciple? Because that's what a, a Christian is a disciple. Amen? And so we're talking about all of these aspects. We're analyzing, we're evaluating our lives. But we can go a little bit deeper. Do you know that? What? Oh, we can go much more deeper than we are. I, I'm just going to give you a little taste of how much more deeper we can go into this aspect. Go with me to Matthew chapter 24. This is all preparing us for something. The fasting, the afflicting of the skull, the praying, the supplication, it's all preparing us for something, my loved ones. Matthew chapter 24. Go with me, please. Remember, I'm just giving you principles. Sharing the things that I want to be prepared for. Matthew chapter 24. Who's there? In, inside of, of the context, again, of the end times. Jesus says, verse 42, what does he say? What does he say? Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. So we are called to do what? To watch. Look at chapter 25, verse 13. Watch, 
Therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is. So what is Jesus telling us that we need to do? Again, and this is the same context, eating and drinking, watching. Why are we, what, are, what is he telling us to do that we need to what? Watch. So does that mean that we're going to all stand outside and sit over there on the ledge and look and say, okay, let's pay attention when Jesus comes. Is that what he's talking about? Watch. Do you think that's what he's literally saying? Or is there a spiritual application? What does he mean when he says, watch, watch? Go with me to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Same context as Matthew chapter 24. Luke chapter 21. If, if you ever uh, have time and you want to find an interesting study, is trying to put the Gospels together. It's a fascinating study. Me and my wife, we've been doing it for a while now. It's great, great studies. Luke chapter 21, verse 33. Who's there? Notice the same context as Matthew chapter 24. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be what? Weighed down with the what? With the carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. Eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage, right? The things of this world. The cars, the houses, all of the things that we've been talking about, right? Your reputation, your education, Oh, I want to have this. It's not wrong to have a degree. It's not wrong to want to have a house. It's not wrong to want to have those things. But is that what God has called you to do? Amen? Was, are you listening to God or are you following the desires of your own heart? And that day come upon you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. What does he say in verse 36? Watch. Therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy. Look, notice this. Watch, therefore, and pray that you will always be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. And to what? To stand before the Son of Man. He says what? Watch and pray. Again, this is the concept of afflicting of the soul. Watch and pray. Why? Why does he want us to watch and pray? So that we may what? So that we may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Now that phrase, stand before the Son of Man, appears in a number of different places in the Bible. I'm going to share just one of them with you. Go with me to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, we know very well it's the sixth seal. And the first part of that sixth seal, I killed the sixth. In his English, it's tough to say that one. The sixth seal. And we know the first part, right? Verse number 12. I looked and he opened the sixth seal and behold there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as, black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became like blood and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a, hot, as a fig tree drops its ligfees when it is shaken by a mighty wind. We know those signs right historically. We have seen those, those fulfillments. They will happen again though. And look at what it says in verse 14. This verse 14 hasn't happened yet. And then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. If the sky receded, that's talking about the first sky, the first heaven, the atmosphere. If the atmosphere is receded, can we breathe? No. This is part of the seven plagues. I have a fascinating study on the seven plagues, Revelation chapter 16. And the seven plagues will undo the six days of creation. And so the atmosphere, the sky is being rolled up. That's undoing those six days, right? And then it says, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Every mountain and every island. I'm from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is in a little island. You think I would not know if Puerto Rico was taken up and lifted out? Australia is an island, right? It says every island and every mountain. And notice what it says in verse number 16. And sell the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to? Again, that same phrase in Luke chapter 21. Who is able to stand? And the answer to that question is who? Revelation chapter 7. The sealed people of God. Who are those that are going to be able to survive through the destruction and the plagues and the end of this earth? Who is going to be able to survive through the great tribulation? Who is going to be able to survive through the battle of Armageddon? Those that are doing what? That are standing. And they need to do what? Watch. Now, there is something much more deeper that I want to share with you. Go with me back to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Watch. Watch and pray. Matthew chapter 26. Everybody there? We're going to start on verse number 36. 
Remember, what does Jesus tell us that we need to do? Watch. Now, again, the Bible says in 1 Peter, it says, watch because your enemy is like a roaring lion, right? Devouring. And he says, watch. Are we supposed to be standing out of our houses, looking out the door to see if a lion is coming by? No. How is it that the enemy is trying to devour us? What is the enemy trying to do? Here's the key. This is something I'm sharing with you what the Lord showed to me. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 says, Then Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and two sons of Sebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. He then said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. Now Jesus is telling the disciples, Watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible that this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That's, was he afflicting his soul? Oh, yes, he was. Then he came to the disciples and found them what? He asked them to do what? To watch, and yet they were? In other words, watching is contrary to sleeping. Are you following me? What happened to the virgins? And he said what? To do what? He said us to? What did he tell us to do? To watch. Verse number 30, 40. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and what? Here's the key. Lest you enter into the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is. Here's the key. Here's the purpose of the afflicting of the soul. Here's the purpose of everything that we've been talking about. Jesus says, watch and pray, lest you what? Enter into temptation. Another way of saying, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation, is rest, less, uh, watch and pray, lest you fall into temptation. Now, what does it mean to fall into temptation? What is that called? Sin. Falling into temptation is sinning. Are you following me? So Jesus is saying, watch. Be prayerful. Afflict your soul so that you are be able to stand on that great day. And he says, watch and pray and afflict your soul. Why? Lest you fall into temptation or lest you sin. And so what he is telling his people is, I want you to have victory over sin. I want you, my people, to show the devil who has been accusing you from the beginning. He accused me. He's still accusing me. And he's accusing you. Why? Because when the devil accuses us, remember we read in Revelation chapter 12, it said what? The devil accuses us day and night. What is the devil's accusation? Look at these human beings. Look at how they love to live in the flesh. How are you going to let them go up to heaven? And not only do they love to live in the flesh, but look at God. He can't keep them from, this, from living in the flesh and from sinning. They love it. And if you're talking about the church, it's even worse. Because they're supposed to be the ones that are supposed to be preaching and giving witness to the world. And they're doing the same things as the world. Eating and drinking. And so the devil is pointing to us, and by pointing to us, he's pointing to God. And so what is the whole concept of God as Christ is trying to tell us? He says, afflict your soul, prepare yourselves. Why? Look at your lives, examine your life, test to see what's going on in your life. Because what? Because I am going to have a people in the end that are going to look at the devil, that are going to look at sin, that are going to look at the world, and going to say, I Choose to live in holiness. I choose to live an upright life. I choose to live by the principles of God. Revelation 14, 12, here is the what? The patience, the perseverance of the saints. Here are those that what? That try to keep the commandments of God. That keep the commandments of God. Amen? And so if they're keeping the commandments of God then by implication, they're what? They're not sinning. Oh, people get uncomfortable when I talk about this. You should get uncomfortable. 
Because the principles of heaven are holiness. And Jesus achieved that, not just to achieve it, but to show you and me that in the same way that he came in the flesh and he did it, you can overcome in the flesh also. Amen? That's the process of sanctification. Oh, you, you're, you're making this up. No, the Bible says it very clearly. Jesus says to the woman that was being stoned, what did he tell her? Go and sin no more. In other words, go and stop being a prostitute. Go and stop fornicating. If he's telling her that she can stop doing it, it's because he's going to give her the power to overcome it. Amen? Because I can do some things through Christ. Because when you talk to some Christians, they're like, oh no, this is just part of the process. Sanctification, yeah, but we're never going to really obtain that great calling of God, of, of, of standing. What, do, what, do you, what does it imply by means you're standing in the presence of God? Implies by standing is that you're living an upright, righteous life, amen? Not through your merits and your power, but through the power of God. But your attitude has to be there. And you have to pl place the conditions so that God can do that work in us. So that the Spirit can complete that work in us. So that what? So that this last generation can vindicate all of the other generations that weren't able to obtain it. And to say, we want to live in holiness. We want to uphold the principles of God. Look at how it says in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, Chapter 43, uh, The Power of Appetite. Again, we're connecting these aspects of temperance with the aspect of having a victorious life, Christian walk. The controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands. When, if they had conquered on this point, they would have had moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. Are you following me? So it's talking about the temptation of appetite and it's saying, if we, can, if we can stick hold, if we can let God do that wonderful work in us, we will be able to overcome all other temptations. But those who are slaves to appetite will what? Fail in perfecting Christian character. Appetite, this is how important this is, and this is why the concept of afflicting the soul is key to the Day of Atonement. God says, if my people will humble themselves and afflict their souls, and what? And repent. If we don't do it, then we're not repenting, and we're going to continue to live and to be slaves to sin. God is not taking people slaves to sin. Are you following me? He's not coming to change the mind. The mind and the character should be done here. He's coming to change this body. So we should be preparing for heaven here on earth. Amen? It continues. The continual transgression of man for 6,000 years has brought sickness, pain, and death as its fruits. And as we near the close of time, which is now, sent Satan's temptation to indulge, indulge what? will be more powerful and more difficult to overcome. So it's getting harder and harder and harder. Are you following me? Now, there's something fascinating about the spirit of prophecy I want to share with you. I was, a couple of years ago, I was planning a, a, a prayer week, and I was, and the, to, the topic was temperance, right, and, and, and appetite and all these things. And, I, and as I was going through, I was, I was also preparing some other studies and studying, and I put the abomination of desolation. Four hits. I have the, uh, the, uh, the LNG White uh, on my computer where you can put a phrase and, and all the quotes. I have it in Spanish and in English. And so I put abomination desolations, like four hits. I put the image of the beast, six hits. I put the mark of the beast, 20, 30 hits. You know, these, these common phrases, the battle of Armageddon, someone hits. Then I put intemperance, 300 hits. Temperance, 350 hits. Character, transformation, restoration, 400 hits. Character perfection, 500 hits. You know what I noticed? What is the spirit of prophecy God has sent it to us for? Yes, to help us to understand the signs. Amen for that. But that's not the focus of her writings. The overbearing focus of her writings is preparing us for those things. And so when you go home, if you don't have the app, you can find it. It's very simple. Do that same experiment and start reading. Just go reading through these hits and you'll be, you're going to have your, you're going to be like, what? 
the focus of all of this, yes, she talks about the events, and, and we know these things, but the focus is on the preparation. Look at what it says in Signs of the Times, following that same point. With man's nature and the terrible weight of his sins pressing upon him, our Redeemer withstood the power of Satan upon this great leading temptation which imperils the souls of men. If men should overcome this temptation, it's talking about the temptation of appetite, he could conquer on every other point. That was the key. The key is appetite. Why? Because it is the most basic and essential need of our physical body. But man shall not live by what? By bread alone, but by every word of God. Amen? And so if, it can't, if the kingdom of God is righteousness, then we should be what? We should be pursuing. We should be seeking. We should be doing what? Focusing on Christ. Amen? Looking at his life. Looking at the things that he did. And follow his example. And that first example that he gave us was? Fasting. Afflicting the soul for preparation for the warfare that was coming forth. And we know that war is coming. What should we be doing? We should not be worrying about the physical aspects of the war. While it's good to know them. But the real important thing is, am I spiritually prepared for these things? And I'm going to close with this last quote from early writings. It's part of the supplemental uh, in the book. And look at what it, she says. This is basically a summary. God is our strength. Yeah, let me say that again. God is our strength. God is our strength. God is our strength. Amen? We must look to him for wisdom and guidance. And what? And keep in view his glory. That's the attitude of that last generation. That's the attitude of those that will be standing in the end. The focusing on what? On the glory of God. They're focusing on vindicating the character of God, amen? On proving the devil wrong. That last generation is going to stand and say, we don't want to live in the flesh. We want to live in the spirit. We want to give our whole, sorry, not 99.9%, 100% complete submission and surrender to God. Clean me from the things of Babylon. Clean me from the desires of the appetite. Cleanse me, Lord, so I can prove to this last generation that we can live as Christ lived on this earth, Amen? It's not easy, but I can do all things through Christ. Amen? Continues. Keeping in view his glory, the good of the church. Amen? The good of the church. Amen? The good of the church. Amen? And the salvation of our souls. Very important too, right? But notice the order. Have you noticed the order? Glory of God, good of the church, and doesn't mean that you're not worrying about your salvation, but when you're worrying about the glory of God and the purpose that God has for us, your salvation is on that same path. Amen? We must what? Overcome our besetting sins. We should individually seek to obtain new victory what? Afflicting the soul. New victory over what? Over the desires of the flesh and of the eyes. Amen? Over the, our, our fallen nature, over those weaknesses. We afflict the soul so that God can show us what they are. And then what? And then we continue to afflict it so God can show us the things we need to do to step away from them and to have victory over them. And it finishes this quote. We must learn to stand alone and what? Some people read stand alone and say, oh, I can do it on my own, right? The holy flesh, no. Standing alone in the sense of that you will be persecuted. We must learn to stand alone knowing that our family might set us aside. Our loved ones might set us aside. Our society might set us aside. You should be able to not follow public opinion. Stand alone but depend wholly upon God. Amen? The sooner we learn this, the better. Let each one find out where he fails. Affliction of the soul. And then faithfully watch that his sins do not overcome him. Woo! That is victory, my loved ones. But that he gets the victory over them. Is it possible? In Christ. And that is the message. I don't know about you, but you know what drives me? I have the fear aspect of thinking that I'm doing right and I'm, and I'm not. But you know what drives me? When I see how the flesh pulls me and I see this struggle between the flesh and the spirit in my life, 
And when that temptation comes, I said, Lord, I want to hold up your name. I want to vindicate your name. And I know the devil is looking when temptation comes. And when temptation comes, when it's, it's at me, and I say, oh, no, Lord, I'm going to say no to temptation, no to sin, and yes to righteousness, and yes to the holiness of Jesus Christ. Amen? And it is possible for you too. Don't let the devil continue to convince you of his lies. He wants us to think you can't do anything about it. You're born in the flesh. That's it. Just put, sit down, put your seatbelt on, and hit cruise control, and you'll be fine. That's not what Scripture tells me. Christ wants us to give us a victorious life. Amen? For the Spirit, the law of the Spirit gives us victory over temptation, over sin. And so I have a question for you today. Is there anybody here this morning that says, I want to prove the devil wrong. I want to show the devil that I am one of those people that want to be standing in the end saying, devil, look at me in the same way as Job, right? Look at him and say, I want to live a victorious life in Christ. That's what really drives me. Amen? Amen. To show God, to show the power of the Holy Spirit, the intercession and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and hold them up by, by living a righteous life in Christ. Not in me, because woo, I'm flawed. But I know that in the power of the Holy Spirit, through Scripture, it says that we can obtain victory. Is there anybody here this morning that says, I want to also stand in those times? Stand up, let's go. If you want to say this, amen? And remember, part of that standing in those end times, part of living that victorious Christian walk has to do with what? Afflicting the soul. Fastings. Amen? So I'll give you small advice. Probably it's better if you go back to your church. Amen? And together with your church, you probably have a, a health director, somebody in your church. Plan the Daniel 10 fast, the Daniel 1 fast. Amen? Plan it out. Some people, because of conditions and certain other things, you know, you might have to modify it. But plan it out. It's not necessarily not eating. But it could be starting to stop eating the things of this world. Amen? Put in those, those sides, those things that we know we shouldn't be eating. Sit together, plan. It's easier if you do it as a church. Do that. Have a revival week during that time. Prayer. And watch God work. Individually, it's amazing. And as a church, it's fascinating. And watch God speak to your church. Speak to you and say the things that we need to step aside and put away. And those things that we need to start doing. And watch God work powerfully in your lives. Every single person that has followed that, everybody has told me, my life has never been the same after that. Amen? Because it's repentance, revival, and reformation. Amen? That's what we want in our lives. Repentance, revival, and reformation. But that happens through afflicting our soul. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity. We thank you, Father, for showing us that you do not want just to forgive us our sins, but you want to give us victory over sin. That we can live a life, a reflection of Jesus Christ. That we can reflect his character that we can reflect his beauty, his love, his patience, his mercy, all the fruits of the Spirit, Father. We know that your Spirit is yearning to do this wonderful work in us, and, and yet we admit, Father, that we haven't, we haven't been following through on the foundations of what this most holy place experience that you have given us. But we know that we still have time, and we know that this time is still with us because you still want us to prepare. And so I ask you, Father, that you help each and every one of us as we are not there, Father, but we are on this path and we want, to get it. we want to get there. As Paul says, continue to strive and move forward. Help us, Father, every day to consecrate our lives, consecrate our marriages, consecrate our families, consecrate our churches, to afflict our soul, to plan together and help you do the wonderful work you want to do with us, in us, and through us. Thank you, Father, for this blessing, for this opportunity to come share together. And, and we ask, Father, that you continue to bless us through the rest of this camp and through the rest of our lives. May we stay humble and hungry for your word, for your son, and may we help us prepare individually and corporately for the things that are coming and our wonderful, wonderful purpose that you have risen up this Seventh-day Adventist church. A wonderful message, Father, that was found nowhere else on earth. The preaching of the three angels' message in this preaching shall be through our testimony. Thank you for the blessing, Father, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for your patience. God bless you.